if I said to you, okay, you want to listen to something that you come back to all the time, a record that you come back to, or a song that's not your own, what's something that you revisit a lot? Is there Are there any records that you revisit? There are. Um, they're not the obvious one. You know, I'm, I'm not... Um... I'm not really a classic rock canon kind of a guy. Um, I guess mm -hmm. this goes but right back to my childhood. I was always more interested in the failures than I was in the success. I say failures in inverted commas, the ones that the albums that perhaps people would always dismiss from people's back catalog. I would always go and say, oh, that sounds interesting. Go and search that out, you know. So like my favorite Pink Floyd record was who was still my favorite band overall, but for sure, was always I'm a Gummer. Because everyone at school okay. was, would say to me, what a terrible, you know, that record's awful. What are they thinking? I was absolutely fascinated by it. I thought it was extraordinary. I mean, it was like something somewhere between 20th century classical music and music concrete and rock music and just the sense of draw. I just loved it. So anyway, I say that by preamble to what I'm going to tell you is the album I come back to more and more and more again more so than any other uh, any other in my collection is a record made in 1972 by tangerine dream and it's called zeit and to me it is the proto ambient record it was a double record with four sides of me four pieces of music one on each side nothing happens nothing happens on this record right it is i know that record i love it i can never get bored of it for me, whenever I put it on, it changes the feeling in the room. It's like what I say about ambient music. It's like perfume. It's almost like just creating an atmosphere which changes your relationship to the space you're in. I love this about ambient music. It's why I've always loved pure texture, you know, music, pure ambient music. So this is a record I come back to. I think I listen to it at least once every month, and I've been doing so for the last 40 years. Um, <laughs> the records I come back to as a producer that still dazzle me, are probably the ABBA records, as well as, well as things mm -hmm. like Dark Side. I think I don't need to hear Dark Side of the Moon ever again. I've, I've heard it so many times, it's almost like implanted in my brain. It's like a microchip in my brain that just feeds Dark Side of the Moon DNA into my creativity. I don't need to hear it. But I come back a lot to, um, to the great ABBA records because here's an example of a band that were totally committed to um, the power of a perfect piece of pop music but that strove, also Benny and Bjorn strove to make those records sound as good as the Beatles, oh, the yeah. Beatles and Beach Boys records that they adored. And they took it to a whole nother level, I think. And, and I, I just constantly in awe of particularly the last, you know, the second half of, of the ABBA career. I'd like to take a second to talk to you about this channel. This is actually Rick Beato too. I've had it since the beginning of my main channel and many of you are not subscribed. As a matter of fact, 87% of the people that watch this channel regularly are not subscribed. So I encourage you to hit the subscribe button on this channel and on my main channel. This will help me get even more of my dream guests and help continue to grow both channels. Thank you. When you're working on these remix records versus working on your own music what what takes priority at this point like what are you working on right now um, i know you've been out touring yeah. and, and uh yes that's right so i just, just so, finished a tour with with porcupine tree we went out we went out on tour for the first time in 12 years maybe the last time we'll do yeah. it again but it was it was a lot of fun um to play the old music and to be a bit nostalgic for once although we did make a new record too so right now i mean i'm it's funny because one of the one of the the words that gets thrown at me quite a lot is workaholic. People think I'm a workaholic um, because I seem to be always doing ten things at once. Um, and part of part of the reason they think that is because it's true. But another reason they think that, another <laughs> reason say, right? yeah another reason they think that is that I I think I work very quickly. Um, People, uh, people are amazed how quickly I work when I'm doing things. And part of that is because I've, I've spent so much time doing it now. I think very intuitively, I, like I said, I, wouldn't, I, couldn't be, I couldn't explain to you how a compressor or a reverb or an EQ works. But if you play me a record by somebody from 50 years ago, 40, 30 years ago, I'll listen to it and I'll say, oh, I know how to get that reverb. And I can do it in about 30 seconds. Because I've been doing it so much, right. I don't want it to sound in arrogant in any way. It's and so 
one of the things I love to do in a way is constantly change it up. And I love to go to the studio one day and say, you know, today I'm going to work on my record. But then tomorrow I might say, okay, now I'm going to go back and work on this, you know, this old chic record I've been remixing or something. Um, and just that being able to just do different things, different days is, is part of what makes it interesting in a way. Um, so I don't tend to be someone that focuses the answer to your question, Rick, is I don't tend to be someone that just focuses on one. Th I have to have all these balls in the air at the same time. Maybe I have a little bit of, you know, I'm a bit um, hyperactive in that sense. Working in digital, you know, working on computers now, since you can just open up a session mm. and you can you can actually go between things, it's actually very different than it was. Yeah. If you were set up to make you're making a record, making a solo record, making a band record, whatever, producing a record, you know, you tend to stay on these projects till they're mm -hmm. finished. Whereas now you can pretty much open up anything and move between things. Oh, I'm going to mix this today exactly. that, you know, something that I worked on three weeks ago and you just go one sign time. So actually that's where digital and working, you know, in DAWs makes it a lot easier to do that, to jump around. Agreed? Absolutely. You know, and I'm I'm an incredible apologist for digital. A lot, a lot of people from my generation, they still, you know, are very much hankering after the analog days. And I love, you know, I, there's certain things I love about analog, but I absolutely love the fact that I'm making music and I'm doing mixes and I'm making records now because I love digital. I absolutely love it. Partly because I'm mm -hmm. not a particularly great musician. So to be able to have the tools capture a not particularly good performance and actually make it sound the way I want. That's great. But not only this, it's also, and this is kind of something you alluded to, I think in your question or, or the point you made is that you can work towards a finished record incrementally now over a period right. of time. And you can put something away for a month. And I do frequently put something away for a month and then come back to it. And it's exactly where you left it and hear it with new ears and a new perspective and realize something about it that you could never have realized when you were too close to it. So that that ability to be able to make records, I mean, I've been making this new record um, incrementally over the last two years, this new solo record I'm making. And this is something else I'm in awe of when I go back and I work on these old records is to realize they made some of these records in three weeks from beginning to end. Right. It's insane. Yeah. And then they would go right. and then they would go and do a week of you know a month of shows and then they'd be back in the studio making their next record. That is insane to right. me. I think it's insane to everyone. We've you know we've we've got to a point now. I mean I t I'm telling people that I'm making this new record and they're going, "Do you ever rest?" And I'm like, "Well, hold on, my last album came out 2 years ago." And it's, it's amazing right. how people's perspective has, has changed. Because when I was growing right. up, out, you know, in the early 80s, bands would make an album every year without every, every year. year. That's right. And the previous record? That was just, you know, you, you look at Elton John, two records a year through through his imperial phase. It's amazing. I met Elton in 2004. We were working at the same studio and um, he invited me and the band I was working with, who he was a fan of. I was producing this band. He invited us in after our session so we go into the into the a studio the studio here in atlanta where i live and um bernie Toppin was there and his wow. band that he's you know yeah, been yeah. playing with forever was there. And we we talked we talked for about an hour and a half and he's and i asked him about this and he said yeah we would spend two weeks making a record writing it and recording it then go out and tour for six months and come back in and make another in two weeks make another it record and go do that and we just know. did that for it years. blows my mind can you imagine anyone doing i mean there probably is someone out there doing that but no. But in terms of mainstream artists now, I think there are several reasons why several reasons why that doesn't happen now. The first reason is that bands are expected to tour for much longer, um, so right. the world has become a smaller place, and touring now pretty much means twelve months of your life if you want to do it properly. And the other reason I think is that the stakes have gone up. When you release a new album now, it's almost like it has to be a hit. It has to be a hit, or your career is over. So you spend so much longer second guessing yourself. And I and I kind I guess in a way I envy those guys working in the early 70s where, you know, it didn't matter if if one album was an experiment that didn't quite 
you know, commercially resonate because the next album was only six months away anyway. And I love that. I, you know, I still maintain that Elton John's run of albums from Elton John through to Blue Moves is the single, and I'm including the Beatles among them. I'm not the biggest Beatles fan, as we've already established. So I'm including the Beatles. Yeah. The Elton run of albums from Elton John through to Blue Moves is the single greatest run in terms of quality that anyone has ever produced. And it blows me. you got to remember 10 albums and two of them were doubles. I mean, that in itself right. is mine is a mind. Yeah. Plug, no, I mean, goodbye. Yellow brick road and blue moves are double albums that that's yeah. something I could never imagine anyone doing that again. 